India's Prime Minister defends his controversial cash ban. Narendra Modi says the reform is needed and has offered incentives to farmers and the poor. But the opposition calls it a failure. So what's behind Modi's plan and will it help the economy? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rochelle Carey. For months now, tens of millions of Indians have been scrambling to exchange their old banknotes. That's after the government of Narendra Modi suddenly banned the 1,500 rupee notes back in November. Modi says the decision will help tackle corruption and stop what's called black money, or cash gained through illicit means. In New Year's message, Prime Minister Modi defended his decision and offered incentives. But the opposition says the entire campaign has been a failure. We'll get to our guests in a moment, but first, Al Jazeera's Fez Jamil has this report. Broadcast in Hindi, followed by English, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi said thank you to the people. We had to queue up and face difficulty in withdrawing your own money. I received letters from many people. They have shared their pain and sorrow with me but also emphasize their support. From November 10th to December 30th, tens of millions in India stood in bank queues to deposit or exchange the 1,500 rupee notes that were declared invalid in a sudden announcement. Despite the hardship, many in these queues supported the government's decision, believing it would help stop tax evasion and corruption, known locally as black money. Corruption, black money, and counterfeit notes had become so rampant in India's social fabric that even honest people were brought to their knees. But the success of the currency withdrawal has been called into question, as illicit money from bribes and undocumented sources have been turning up during and even just after the withdrawal. Hours before the Prime Minister's broadcast, India's largest opposition party announced a countrywide strike in January to remind the government that not everyone supports the plan. Aside from the political opposition, many economists say the currency withdrawal had a negative effect on the Indian economy. And it's a bit like taking 86% of the blood circulation out of a person and then saying, OK, now go run a marathon. You are destroying employment and livelihoods, and that will have negative multiplier effects over time. So we're just seeing the beginning of this. All the people who have lost livelihood and economic activity today, and workers who've lost their daily wages, that is going to feed into the economy. But many people have stood by the government, believing that something had to be done. In this fight against corruption and black money, it is clear that you wish to walk shoulder to shoulder with us. For us in government, this is a blessing. But it's not clear yet if this policy will be a blessing for India's economy and the tens of millions who have stood in queues. Fez Jamil Al Jazeera. Let's take a closer look at the impact of the decision to ban the 1,500 rupee notes. India had one of the fastest growing economies in the world in the first half of last year, but in December, the Reserve Bank of India cut the expansion forecast for this year to 7.1 percent from 7.6 percent earlier. An association that monitors businesses in the country has warned of a significant fall in growth because of this cash ban. In November alone, foreign investors sold nearly $3 billion worth of Indian stocks. Let's bring in our guests now. In New Delhi, Sanjay Hegde, senior advocate of India's Supreme Court, who's represented Indians who have challenged the government's monetary policies. In Hyderabad, Shriram Chalia, dean of the Jindal School of International Affairs. And also in New Delhi, Ratika Kira, economic economist at the Indian Institute of Technology. And welcome to all of you. Appreciate it. Um, I start the same question to all of you. Sanjay, you can go first. Um, how would you characterize Narendra Modi's speech? Well, Mr. Modi could have done a lot, and uh, a lot of people thought that there was something big coming. But at the end of the day, we just got a laundry list of uh, thank yous and uh, certain uh, relief programs, which are normally 
a advance during the in Indian budget. There was nothing spectacular in the speech. It, uh, uh, there were, the build-up promised something huge, but this was a routine litany of uh, economic measures which don't seem to particularly address any problem in particular. This is just a little bit of uh, band-aid on uh, gaping wounds which were caused over the last 53 days when uh, India has been short of currency. The economy has suffered consequently. Uh, Prime Minister Modi probably was just thanking all the people of India for bearing with him, but he has not given us any time frame by which the current problems will end. Okay, we will um, come back and address a, a lot of those points she brought up. But first, um, Shiram, your thoughts on, on what Narendra Modi had to say? I think Narendra Modi is a great political communicator. And uh, his speech, uh, 50 days after the demonetization drive began, uh, emphasizes how he's trying to um, establish a direct connection with the masses and with the people uh, in a populist vein and uh, explaining uh, the benefits of this move uh, with the uh, array of statistics. He talked about how our tax revenues have improved by 13 uh, percent. He spoke about how digitization is increasing, how the society is moving from a pre-modern into a modern uh, vein of um, conducting transactions. He tried to also uh, mobilize the society once again behind him by saying that this is a, actually a war, an internal war, a purification ritual, he said uh, in Hindi, to try and arouse the masses behind him uh, to stand with him. And he, of course, also promised uh, an area of uh, welfare schemes uh, by which he's saying that this is a redistributive measure. The wealth that has been captured and has come back into the banks as a result of the scrapping of the 500 and 1,000 rupee notes is, he's saying, going to now create a dividend for the poor, for farmers, uh, and for the downtrodden. So this is a, a massive experiment in social uh, re-engineering and economic re-engineering that he's trying. And I think he still has the numbers behind him. People are not just bearing with him, but actually largely supporting what he's doing. We haven't seen a single major protest movement in a country that is used to protest despite the inconvenience that's been caused. Okay. So it clearly shows that he has the pulse of the people and he's playing on uh, the, this, these okay, uh, sure, you know, pent-up frustrations and trying to channel the energies of people against what he calls the evildoers who are the corrupt and the, those okay, who are giving okay, taxes. Okay, if I could stop you for, for just a moment. Um, okay, so you clearly um, had a different takeaway from the speech. Ratika, your thoughts? You know, the speech, I think, was basically a continuation of a pattern that we have seen in the past, which is every time the government is cornered, they shift the goalpost. So within the first two weeks, when, uh, you know, people were beginning to question the principle behind uh, the demonetization policy, the government tried to repackage it as something not against uh, black money or counterfeit currency, but as something that needed, that was uh, done to push the country towards a cashless, digitized sort of economy and then yesterday again that pattern has been repeated that there was very little discussion about the fallout of this uh, uh, of the policy of demonetization the uh, you know the tanking of the growth rate that uh, most economists are expecting the devastation that it has caused in the informal sector which is more than half of the gdp in this country uh, and then again uh, starting to talk about all so all sorts of different things uh, so <laughs> it's very hard to say what the government has in mind and what one should really make of that speech. Um, Sanjay, let me go back to you. Let's talk about demonetization as a policy. Do you think it is flawed, that the very premise of it is flawed? It's like this. If you take away 86% of the currency which runs your economy, it's like probably taking an equivalent amount of blood from your uh, body. Will the patient survive this kind of radical measure? I, uh, the jury is out. The uh, truth is that people have been gasping. People have been bearing with it. People have tried to get on with their lives. But a lot of the informal sector, as uh, my panelists pointed out, has collapsed. There are many, many villagers who used to come to the cities to earn in currency and to send it back to their villages. Many of them have gone back home. I was talking to uh, a real estate developer whose project was near completion and who would ordinarily have been doubling his workforce. He says that about two-thirds of his workforce has returned to the uh, village because they are just not interested 
in paying in being paid in any other form of currency other than cold hard cash we as a country are people who like the feel of money who like to know how much exactly they are worth and very often we uh, as a, uh, the vast majority of indians do not have money stashed away in the bank that uh, uh, bank money is naturally inaccessible for the kind of uh, sudden emergencies that are uh, very often uh, seen in indian life the idea that you could take an economy of this kind suddenly yelling dragging its feet straight into the uh, digital world where you're uh, in, in in a country where though you have internet penetration geographically it has not yet reached most indians where uh, often electricity is a problem even to recharge your mobile phones mm -hmm. in that kind of country to say we will go digital i think it's a very tall order and it requires more than just will to Sh suddenly overnight jump towards that promised land. Okay, Shiran, let me ask you this. Do you believe in this in demonetization as a policy? Is the problem the policy? Is the policy been the execution? I don't think uh, there's a problem in the policy or in the basic idea. I think um, there are vast hordes of illegal cash that have accumulated in what we call the parallel economy. Uh, or some people call it the black economy and this you know to try and bring all that cash to suck it out like a vacuum cleaner i think that's what modi is doing and he's trying to actually bring it into the mainstream into the into daylight and i think that will eventually uh, you know generate a lot of benefits to the economy as well as to the society there's a change in the mindset what he's asking people is uh, you know Think about national interest. Think about social interest. Think about larger public good. But, not but just isn't that self-centered? Uh, that's a lofty. That's a, that's a attitude transformation is affected. Can you hear me, Sri Ram? That that's a lofty goal to try to think of society as a whole. But if you're barely making it as it is, and then all of a sudden the money you had is worthless, what are you supposed to do? Well, no, I mean, the supply of the uh, new replacement notes, uh, the situation has been easing uh, day by day, and it's going to get better in the new year, and he has promised it, and we have no reasons to disbelieve that. So I don't think, you know, it's causing the same kind of pain that's being described by my colleagues uh, on the show. Rather, if you go down to the street, I mean, consumption has fallen a bit, and uh, it has uh, people have taken a hit, but then they are thinking about how we need to sacrifice in order to create a new India. You know, this is a transformative process. This cannot be achieved by simply sitting back and saying, you know, we are corrupt, we are immoral, nothing will ever change, and people will flout the norms all the time. I think he's trying to create a kind of a moral revolution in the society. Okay. And okay. look at it from that point of view. Shriram, just a moment. Um, Ratika, does Shriram have a point when he's saying sometimes there needs to be painful change to grow? No, I think the uh, policy was uh, bad in principle and it was badly implemented. Ca black economy, the black economy in India is definitely a concern, but that's a flow. You know, people generate uh, black income by un not declaring it to the government. Once they've generated black income, they're unlikely to hold it as cash. What they would do is to convert it into other forms which appreciate over time. So it could be US dollars, it could be gold, it could be property. Income tax rates in India have shown that only 6% of their haul is in the form of cash. So, you know, the, the stock of black money is very small and this policy did absolutely nothing to do uh, to counter the flow of it which is the generation of it over a period of time which could be through underbilling etc for that what the government needs to do is to do tax reform to widen the tax base in india only 3% of the population is uh, you know has a pan card which is in the income tax base only 1 to 2% of them pay income tax and that's really the thing that should have been done and it could have been done without demonetization so what the government has done is basically because it can't catch the rat inside the house they've set the house on fire we are seeing that uh, you know uh, aggregate demand is going down in many different sectors including the formal sector it's not only the informal sector that's 
been hit. Uh, so I don't think the principle of it was good. And of course, the implementation, everyone is admitting uh, that they could have done better. They didn't think of uh, the recalibration of ATM machines that would be required because the new notes were of a different size. Apparently, ink was uh, not available. Now, paper seems to have run out. So the levels of uh, poor implementation and planning are also quite uh, mind-boggling. Sanjay, did, was there anything in the speech that you thought w was a good takeaway? He did talk about um, benefits for, for pregnant women. He talked about um, discounted interest rates. Is there anything that he talked about in the speech that you thought was a good sign for improving the economy? You see, you must remember where he came from. His, in his election campaign, he promised to bring black money from abroad, and he, he gave an actual figure. Which he actually of, did not uh, mention one in and the speech. Half million rupees. Yes, uh, one and a half million rupees in each Indian's account. That never came. Then he struck against black money domestically. There was some kind of back-of-the-envelope calculation that at least the poor would, uh, would get 100,000 rupees in uh, uh, each of their bank accounts. That also has not happened because most of the currency has come back into the banks and so there, they, uh, so there is no uh, actual cash dividend coming out of this exercise. So at the end of the day, what does he do? He has repackaged uh, 6,000 rupees for pregnant women, which was an old scheme and which was never implemented. So for the past two years, we, the, that which ought to have been given was not given. Now he's, he has announced once again that it will be. Uh, there has been minor tinkering with the uh, interest rates for certain specific sections, for the seniors, for uh, certain house loans, but they are absolute little band-aids to cover gaping wounds which have been caused by this unnecessary exercise in misery. Sri Ram, is Narendra Modi facing um, a lot of political pressure? It would seem that he is. It, I, re I realize that you received the speech well, there's a lot of people that did not receive the speech or the policies well. He, he's trying to, to solidify his party, but how much political pressure is he facing? I think he's still unrivaled uh, as the national leader of India. There is no competition in terms of any opposition. Um, he still enjoys uh, sea water. For example, a well-respected uh, public opinion poll conducted a survey after the demonetization, and uh, people approved of the job, people approved of the policy by 80%. And, you know, give or take a few error um, uh, uh, ratio points, this is pretty representative. So I think uh, he believes that he is now in a position where he can directly talk to the masses, as I said, and through his executive will, can shake up the nation, can create some kind of a vision for an alternative way of living. And he said, I want to make honesty um, as something that pays in this country because traditionally we've had a situation where dishonesty has and there's been not a single corruption scam in the central government uh, which has been running for the last two and a half years so he has credibility when he's talking about it people are not cynical I know a lot of the so-called intelligentsia are cynical and the experts have been frothing but the point is the average people of this country are behind him and they have not really raised uh, uh, you know, much of a protest because all they see is at the end of the day, the rascals should be punished. So it's a populist move, I, I will admit it. But at the end of the day, that counts. I mean, with Donald Trump, it counts. With Narendra Modi, it counts. I mean, it, people vote for these people uh, rally we behind this. So I think he's counted. not in a uh, disadvantage. Rather, I think he, I'm okay. looking at him right, right, as, right. you know, continuing to do well at the national level. There may be some setbacks in states. Okay, sure, Ram, just there, a moment. Just a I moment. Him, uh, uh, I, I give, I I give I want to give Ratika... I want to give Ratika a chance to reply because I could definitely read your face and, and your body language and you wanted to get in on this, Ratika, go right ahead. Uh, you know, so uh, when the policy was announced, there was an expectation that 25 or 30 percent of the cash that was demonetized wouldn't come back. And in fact, what they found is that almost everything has come back. So this either means that there wasn't any black money in the first place, but more likely what has happened is that people who had stashes of undeclared cash, uh, they have managed ways of depositing back into, uh, uh, into the banks. Uh, this is, you know, and over the 
past few days, there have also been reports of how the banking system has been corrupted by this move. So a move that was supposed to kill black money and black economy has in fact created new avenues of generating black money. Anyway, uh, given this, you know, the, this point about pub public support and no protest, you know, these people who are affected, they can barely survive on a day-to-day -day basis. They don't have the energy to go out and protest. And there is no political opposition. Uh, Sri Ram was right uh, saying that there is no political opponent to uh, Modi. Uh, uh, can I finish? Sri Ram, Sri Ram, I, I will let you reply, I promise. But let Ritika finish first, please. Okay. So, you know, the, there is some, there was some element of people on the street saying, yes, this is good for the nation. But that uh, that statement was based on a massive propaganda and misinformation spread by the government that this was going to kill the black economy. We know that this is not going to kill the black economy and people are believing the government's rhetoric, which unfortunately is not true. But going back to the speech, which is really the thing that I wanted to speak about, uh, he did uh, mention maternity entitlements and this is a very important announcement if it is actually implemented. As Sanjay said before me, in 2013, the National Food Security Act was implemented and for the first time in this country the principle of universal maternity entitlements was recognized. In India maternity entitlements today exist only for women in the organized sector and that's less than 10% of the workforce. For the rest of them there's absolutely no form of uh, social support and if implemented uh, you know we have been waiting for three years for the government to fulfill its legal obligation to start giving pregnant women 6,000 rupees per child, but there has been absolutely no allocation uh, for women in any of the budgets since 2013. So if this is implemented, at least that will be some gain uh, for, for the country. I mean, it's hardly going to make up for the damage that has been caused, but at least it will be a long-term gain. Uh, just to explain why maternity entitlements are so important, uh, you know, in India, child, nutrition, child undernutrition rates are amongst the highest in the world. Every second child is underweight. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the main reasons for this is uh, poor maternal health. Women in India don't gain enough weight during their pregnancies. So, at the end of their pregnancy, they weigh less than women at the beginning of their pregnancy in Africa. Just, just, and that if, leads to low birth weight babies. If you could give me uh, just a moment. I, I, I hate to cut you off. We are tight on time. But, and I, and I, and I want to make sure that I that give the other gentleman a chance to reply. But what you're saying is, obviously, if this actually comes to fruition, um, this particular benefit to to pregnant women, it could really make a huge difference. But as, as you and Sanjay both said, it remains to be seen if that's actually going to happen. Um, Sanjay, going forward here, going forward, um, you obviously are very skeptical of these policies of what's been happening. Who can hold Narendra Modi's feet to the fire? Well, the Supreme Court ought to have held his feet to the fire. But the case is going on, and uh, hopefully uh, when the new session begins from tomorrow, if the case is speeded up, maybe some tough questions could be asked. But ultimately, every politician politician's feet can be held to the fire only through the ballot box. The people of India are watching. There are important state elections coming up in uh, India's most populous states. The impact of demonetization and as to whether there is actual public support rather than uh, opinion polls which could uh, probably mean anything, that will be seen on, in, the bat, uh, in the electoral battlefield within a few months from now. The other p uh, set of people who can actually p keep his feet to the fire are the very people who supported his campaign, the businessmen and the business interests who, uh, who have been very badly hit. One of the best bellwethers of the Indian economy is how many two-wheelers are sold per month. When people are, uh, uh, Indians can't afford cars, but uh, everybody at least aspires to uh, run a motorcycle or a scooter. Sales there have dramatically dipped. Business will soon be calling the Prime Minister and telling him that the act needs to shape up or ship out. Okay. And that will have to be the last word on our very lively discussion. And thank you to um, all of you for joining me for this discussion. Sanjay Hegde, Shiram Chalia, and Ratika Kira.
And thank you for watching. You can uh, watch the program again anytime if you go to our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, you can go to our Facebook page. That is facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Rochelle Carey, the entire team, bye for now.